My guest today is Jennifer Marsman. Jennifer, my friend, how are you? It's good to see you again, David. I'm doing well. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's been way too long. Uh, and uh, you've, um, I think you have a new job since, it's not new to you, but it's new to me. What's, tell me what you're doing these days. <laughs> I do. So I am working right now in the office of the CTO at Microsoft, and it's a it's a really exciting job because I get to focus on my passion, which is generative AI. And my team specifically in the office of the CTO is a team called the Strategic Partnerships Team. So obviously our biggest strategic partner is OpenAI. And um, <laughs> OpenAI, uh, so I am very fortunate to get to be one of the first people to do technology transfer. So um, I do some of the explorations of new models as they come online. And I get to, um, you know, try out the new things and think about how could they benefit Microsoft and, you know, which which product groups should have awareness of this and how do we train the field to be able to talk about this these models. Um, and I also work with um, some of the generative AI groups within Microsoft. So um, I've worked with uh, Phi3 recently, Ooh, and oh, that's nice. pretty cool. Yeah. And then um, I work with um, strategic partners that Kevin cares about. So besides OpenAI, obviously our biggest one, they take the lion's share of my time. Uh, but we should point also... out that Kevin Scott is the CTO. And so the office CTO mm -hmm. is actually named yeah. for him. That is right. That is right. I also work for Kevin Scott on his strategic partners. So think about some Fortune 100 companies that are interesting. And so I try to work with them, um, similar to what you and I did in the past, um, David, in like CSE and such. I work with some of the large strategic partners and just kind of help unblock their technical challenges hmm. um, and help make them successful. So I do a little bit of that as well. Um, and at Build, like we featured at Build in, in 2024, we featured Etsy. And that was um, work that I had done with them. I did like weekly office hours with them and helped them be successful with their solution. And they have a team of like just brilliant engineers. And so at Build, uh, I did a session with the CTO of Etsy, as well nice. as their head, yeah, as well as their head of engineering for like the, the search engineering um, was, was there at Build. And so the three of us did wow. a talk at, at Build in 2024 to talk about Very kind cool. of the Etsy. And you, I think you were part of the keynote at Build, weren't you? I was, yes. Yeah. So that was in support of Kevin. Um, so working for Kevin, one of the... Um, one of the other cool things I get to do, the final kind of piece of my job, is that I am um, Kevin's official demo engineer. So I write, I assist him in kind of helping make compelling demos that illustrate his vision. So it's um, it's really neat. So we can talk a little bit more about some of those demos if you like. But when, when people ask about the office of the CTO, like the, the biggest comparison I make is that it's a lot like being a grad student again. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's like Kevin is this, you know, brilliant professor. Like he's he's the guy with like the vision, and he has like this vision on a mountain that we're all marching towards. But you know, when you're a grad student, part of what you're doing is is taking what the professor feeds you and like his goal and like running experiments and trying to validate that and competitive analysis and just thinking very deeply about that direction and trying to help. Um, figure out how to get there. So part of it is just like being an extension of his brain. And okay. then part of it is actually the other way, like us bringing stuff to him where, mm. you know, we might see an insightful, you know, paper or something and like make sure to bring that to his attention. Right. So part of it is it's like a two way communication, much like a grad student, right? When you're, when you're supporting a professor like this, you know, there's some really smart person whose vision you believe in and then you are both kind of um supporting them and helping make their vision a reality as well as like trying to give them the relevant information they need um to make sure that everything continues to be well informed this sounds like a really cool job it is it is I'm it sounds busy. like it keeps you really really busy though it does it does it does um so it's definitely one of the um it's the most i've had to work with executives for sure mm -hmm. which is a different way of working as you know 
Um, I tend to be a rambler in real life. Like I love to just talk and life. tell people everything about everything. You can't talk that way to executives. You have to make it very <laughs> oh, short. Oh, I see. The they're, point. Yes. Their time is precious. <laughs> they got, got stuff it. to do. Yep, yep. So it's like, oh. okay, how do you say this? And we're, we're, when we used to write talks, like, um, you know, David and I met, or actually we met when, or both of us were in evangelism for a long time at Microsoft. Right. We and met so, like 20 years ago. Yes, yes. But one of the things that was so one of the things that I believe, and I'd be curious to know if you believe this too, David, is that a five minute talk is infinitely harder than an hour long talk. <laughs> like give me Some an hour us, long yeah. talk. Yeah. Any day. Like I can just go in and like do an hour long talk almost flat. Like it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's very easy because you don't have to be succinct and to the point and like really understand what your key message is. But when you do, um, um, a talk that is like a five minute talk, like you those, have to like boil it down. The hardest talks I've done have been yeah, exactly, and you have to be able to tell that story very succinctly and quickly, and hit your key points in a way that's compelling and that somebody can get the the whole picture, even without all of the context, um, in like five or ten minutes. And those, it's, I think, are really. Challenging. It's funny you bring that. Up. That's that's a skill that uh, a lot of people never learn is how to boil mm -hmm. things down to the mm -hmm. the key points. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of that as well. I've, I, I can't count the number of times I said, oh, we're out of time. Oh, uh, here's a bunch of yeah. links to the demos I didn't show you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It is. It's a really hard skill. But like that's one of the things I feel that working very closely with executives, you have yeah. to get better at that. And I'm still not perfect, but um, I, it's something that I'm working on. Very cool. Let's get back to the RAM then, because I want to hear about some of the specific yes. projects yes. and demos that you did. Uh, they, okay. they sound really cool. It, it is that has been a lot of fun. So, um, thinking back to the very beginning, I was first hired into Octo, the office of the CTO, in um, like maybe it's been like over two years now. Okay. And the very first model, the model that was just shipping at that point in time when I joined the team, was Dolly. And oh, so, yeah. I was one of the first folks to get to play with Dolly. And tell, tell, tell the folks that don't know what is Dolly. Sorry, DALI is an image generation model that was created by our partner, OpenAI. And so it was at the time that when DALI 2 released, that was when I was joining um, Octo about two years ago. And it was a level of image generation that just had not been done yet. It was completely state of the art. People were, yeah, right. were losing their minds. And so it was so it was exciting. Very cool. Yeah, to be a tiny, tiny part of that. And so when I joined, I was kind of thinking back to my evangelism roots and said, hey, like, why don't we do something where I um, solicit prompts? Um, because the, basically the way Dolly works is that the input is text, right? You can put in like, um, give me a picture of an underwater castle with mermaids and coral and seashells and whatever. Yeah. And high, as high quality digital art or as a cartoon or as a oil painting, whatever you want. And then, um, so you're feeding in text and then the output is an image. Right. And so um, what I did was I solicited prompts on Twitter. I did like a 30 days of Dolly 2 type um, effort, uh, initiative, whatever. And it was, it was really cool because just that kind of, uh, what is it, hive mind or whatever. It yeah. was a lot of really diverse prompts because sure. it was so many people <laughs> contributing. Yeah. So it was really fun because it really enabled me to test the limits of like, what was possible because people would ask for just, you know, different things because I had tried a bunch of things on my own, but then people would think of new things that I hadn't thought of. And so I really got to kick the tires and understand the limits of where it went well and where it didn't. And by the end of that exercise, by the end of that month, the, the 30 days, I knew very well, like kind of where the limits of the model were. And almost before you gave me the, like, you could just give me a prompt and I would be able to tell you, Ooh, it's going to do well with that. Or, Oh, it's not going to do with that. Oh, interesting. These reasons. Yeah. So it's just that, you know, the kind of thing where hands-on learning, you always learn the most by, by getting sure. hands-on. So that was kind of my very first um, foray or one of the first things I did with um, the office of the CTO. And you can still find them. They're Dolly too. So they're a little bit dated. The images aren't as yeah, exciting. I think we're on three now, right? We are on three now. Um, it's funny. There's an internal conference that I'm I'm helping organize right now at Microsoft, and one of the things that we do is we create little connection cards for folks. So um, it's a really nice thing to do at a conference. Honestly, if you organize conferences, you should do this if at all possible. But you have a little card. Let me show you. Let me hold on. Okay. Let me grab one. Um, here is I think this is mine from last year. Um. This is mine from last year. Doop. 
So okay. you see, you have your picture on the yep. front and like your name and stuff. And then on the back, they asked you to create an image with that Dolly. represented you. Yeah, with Dolly. And so like I did something with a phoenix. Um, and, uh, just cause of the whole rising from the ashes is something that I try uh-huh. to live by. You know, you always come back from your, from your, your shortcomings. And, um, this is, so this is what I did last year. And then you, it, it has really nice, like talking points. So this is great, like networking for introverts to have like, ah. here's a couple of key things like, Oh, why did you choose that picture? And like, what are the things that you're into? And what do you, what do you do? It's here? like a baseball like, card. Yeah, it is. But does, and then, uh, does the barcode go to that online? The same information? Yeah, it, it goes to my LinkedIn, I think. So oh, this I goes see. to LinkedIn so that people can connect with each other on LinkedIn. But it's a great internal conference. And these cards are just so compelling because Very cool. um, I remember faces better than I remember names, honestly. Yeah. And so I still have these collections, these decks of cards from long ago. And I pull out the thing and look at people's faces and be like, oh, yeah, that person. Like, I can remember the faces. Ah, so, so you hand them out like a business card. Yes. Yes. Okay. So you get a, a deck of cards. That is, I get a deck of all Jennifer Marsman's. Got it. Right? And then my goal is to get a full a deck. Co- of complete like set. So you go, you have to meet everyone, you exchange cards like this, and then you get this, and then every, what you take home is kind of what you've done. So I give away the Jennifer Marsmans, and then I right. get um, what everyone else I'll does. give away two, but those are going to be worth something. Organizer. Yeah, <laughs> do it. It's, it. it's so good. It's so nice for introverts and for remembering things later, and I just, like, I love it. When I was running the AI for Earth program, um, right. the engineering team and evangelism and such for, for AI for Earth, we ran a conference for all of our grantees, and I, I did that same thing. I made those Very things. Cool. I love the idea so much. Yeah. All right. So anyway, backing up. Um, so yeah, so Dolly was one of the first things that I did. And then I also have a Dolly demo on my on my GitHub right now, which is something that we did at Build like two years ago, which was, uh, um, it was actually an experiment that I had done with a colleague of mine in Okto when I was trying to help him like understand how to create good prompts for image generation. Right. For Dolly. And so I said, you know, picture, you know, create a picture in your mind. Now try to explain it to me. Like, tell me what it would look like. And he's like, okay, um, a baseball stadium. And I said, okay. And I typed that into Dolly. I did like a, and it generated a baseball stadium. And he's like, oh, no, 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 no. Actually, I was picturing this. And so it, it helped him realize kind of the level of detail. Yeah. So um, he was picturing, like, I think it was the view, like, from on the field. And he was picturing a view from, like, the stands looking down. Yep. Mm-hmm. And then he was picturing, um, like, whether it's, like, an empty uh, baseball field versus people on the field. And then I think he was picturing like an old timey, like sports from like the 1920s, uh-huh. 1930s kind of look. And so, so anyway, we just, we kept iterating and he kept adding more details and I kept adding it to the prompt. And then we got closer and closer to the image in his mind. And that helped him learn yeah. how to write a good prompt essentially. And so what I did was I create, I kind of gamified that and I created a demo of that where there's a, um, you can look on my GitHub, but there is a um, uh, something, a piece of code on there in C Sharp. I think I wrote that one in C Sharp. And you just type in a prompt. It will call Dolly, and then it will give you the response back. And then um, in this particular one, I have an image there. So imagine on the left side of the screen, there's an image. And then you have to guess the prompt that wrote it. <laughs> And then um, you put in the prompt and then it will generate something and you can see how close it got to the original one. And it's never going to be 100% perfect because remember, these are non-deterministic algorithms. So it's going to generate something new every time. But when it gets fairly close um, in the spirit of it, um, I think. Cool. I'm looking at your GitHub uh, repos right now. Which which project is it? I think it's called Prompt something. Is it one of the pinned ones? What are, read the pinned oh, ones. Uh, the pin was, if I go back to overview, I see yeah. podcast pilot prompt engineering with Dolly. That must be it. Prompt engineering with Dolly. That's the one. Yep. Very cool. That's right. the one. And oh, there's then, some setup involved, so I can't try it right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can, you can try it later. It's, it's fairly good. Um, or I hope it's useful. Tell me if it's not, I'll fix it. <laughs> Even if it's fun, that's enough. Yeah. And that's still hooked up, I think, to Dolly 2. I should actually go back and make sure that works with Dolly 3. Um, I should update my repo. Um, So that was another one I did. And then um, the podcast one that you mentioned there, that was for Build last year, I think, Build 2023. Podcast Copilot. 
Yep. That was Kevin's keynote demo last year. He hmm. wanted to do a something that showed kind of an end-to-end co-pilot experience. And hmm. so what I did with that demo was I created a... Um, it was just calling a series of models. Um, we were kind of, you know, we've been thinking a little bit more about like what do orchestration layers look like? And you've probably heard of orchestration layers like the semantic kernel and Langchang and such. And so um, there's a lot of power in being able, being able to string together model calls to create something that's ultimately okay. useful. And so what we did with Kevin's um, demo there was a, it was a real life use case where Kevin loves podcasting so he has a podcast called um behind the tech and i actually didn't know that don't tell kevin (laughs) yeah yeah no kevin has a podcast he's he loves podcasting but he hates creating the social media posts for them (laughs) like he hates Uh, the like promotion of it aspect uh, and so so this helps this does it automatically that's what it does that's exactly what it does so it takes the audio as input and then it uses the whisper model to do like speech to text. This was before um, some of the models that could take audio as a, as a native input. Um, but it did speech to text with whisper, the whisper model from OpenAI. And then it did, um, it it used, I'm trying to remember what the next step was. I think it used. Well, it has to do with some summarization of it to figure it out. It does, yeah. So it, I think it did extraction first. I think I used another local model to extract the guest name from the podcast. So I did ah, kind okay. of an entity extraction thing where I looked for the the who, who the guest he was interviewing, and mm-hmm. then I called like a Bing web search to get a bio for that particular oh, guest, wow. and then I called um, like GPT four or one of the stronger models to do a summary on the on the. Um, on the actual and that became the text time. of yeah, your yeah. social media post yep they did that yeah summary for social media and then i actually called i think gpt4 to generate a prompt that i then fed into dali to create an image to go with the post oh, as well very and then the that final step is very clever yeah and then the final step was like a hit hit send and then it would um it actually posted to we we wrote a little uh, thing in conjunction with the LinkedIn team that would like post it to LinkedIn, so it was a really cool like end to end demo of something that was actually useful to Kevin. And then for build this year, we we did a couple of different things. Um, I had a five three demo that we ended up having to cut for time, but it is oh. available on my um, on my GitHub. Right now, okay. it's a i3 recycling demo, and that okay, will... just really quickly, can you just tell us yeah. what is i3? That's fairly new. Yeah, so i3 is a small language model. So we've had there's so many amazing large language models um, that typically run in the cloud because they're so big. It's not something that you can run on a on um, you know some of these you know my own laptop kind of thing can't handle that that level. Usually run on multiple GPUs, and so. When you think about it, um, they are amazing, but some of the downsides that you can get with large language models is that they can be expensive if they're behind an API, they're very costly to run, and um, and there can be latency challenges with um, with the models just because they are bigger, and then the network bandwidth and such, and you can't run them offline, so those kind of things. And so, yeah. um, but they do have the highest quality. Right. So, so there's for, a trade-off. For, yeah, it's everything in life is a trade-off, right? So with small language models, I started thinking about like, what are the benefits? And really the the idea, the thing that Kevin wanted me to think about is like, what is a new scenario that Phi 3 would enable that we just did not have before? And so I started thinking about that. And you you, you know that I used to work on the AI for Earth team. So an yeah. AI for good has always been just is like I so close we do to a show on that here. Yeah, it's something that I just, I've always cared about very, very deeply. And so one of the scenarios I started thinking about is, um, trash and recycling, right? Because that is, I don't know if anyone has visited the inside of Microsoft. We have separate bins for like trash, recycling, compost. There's like so many options. And I am like always afraid of like putting thing in the wrong bin and then just like destroying like the whole bunch of- The smartest thing they did was to put pictures above them. They didn't used to have them. You had to just guess. Is this it's compost? getting better. It's Is getting it... <laughs> easier, but it's still like hard. And then when you consider that recycling guidelines are different in different areas, like oh, yeah. it's just really hard for people to know sometimes like what goes where. And so the idea behind this model is that no one 
people would likely not pay like GPT-4 levels of, or GPT-4.0 or GPT-V, which are some of the image understanding models um, that we have in, in that um, in that class, in the GPT class of, of cloud models and large language models, um, they would likely not pay those prices and couldn't call like at the scale of people throwing away trash in say like a public park, right. for example. But that is something that Phi3 could now enable. And hmm. so Phi3 actually has an image one. There's just a text-to-text -text version of Phi3, but there is one image understanding um, version, Phi3 Vision, Phi3 with Vision, which um, allows for uh, an image with the input as well, and then it will um, print out text. And so, oh, okay. explaining it. so what you can do is in your prompt, you can specify, here are the recycling guidelines in my area, like cardboard can't be, can be recycled, and so can this and this and this. And then the things that can't be recycled are aerosol cans and styrofoam and whatever is not um, recyclable mm -hmm. in your area. And so by just putting those kind of things in the prompt, then you just hold it up <laughs> to the camera. Like the actual demo is you just hold up the an item and it will say whether it needs to go and recycle your in the Very trash. Very cool. It is. It's a really and that, and it's, is it is it all running locally? Are you are the Phi 3 model is, running on your phone? Yes. That's so, another um, huge advantage. It's it's not phone. So this was actually a um so theoretically it can run on the phone. I okay. did not try that. Um, but I've heard it's a web, like, theoretically it's a web it should app. be able to run on like an iPhone and some of the other um phones with with really nice kind of um hardware specs okay but the um it, the example that i did i was running on my laptop um oh i see so it was, it was local yeah. local to a it laptop was running like locally that. on a laptop with a gpu i had Got a it. laptop with a gpu that i was using for build yeah and so that one i ran it locally there but i had the phi 3 model running and i just i and i literally i actually did a test on the airplane <laughs> When I was flying uh, to nice. build, like I'm like, okay, there's no there's, better offline test than a test on an airplane. And I was holding this up plastic cup from a non-alcoholic non beverage. <laughs> one of the um, one of the images I threw on the on the README file was like me on the airplane going ee -ee with a <laughs> stupid thing, but I was just it was just made me laugh to like. I see it. Oh, it's an uh, <laughs> Aquafina yeah. bottle. Got it. Yeah, an aerosol can, and you look yeah, horrified you holding the aerosol can. <laughs> Right, right. Yep. And, and that couldn't be recycled. So, so yeah, but, it, but it's a great example of a scenario that is enabled with these small language models because it, they have lower latency. They are, you know, you don't have the, the cost um, element to them if it's running locally. And you can imagine just having it running locally, like a little small device, like in a, um, in a public park, like inside the trash can, if, you know, yeah. some of those trash cans, we have to open them and only the, the janitors or whatever can get in, then you, you can easily enable that kind of scenario so that was a really cool example that we didn't end really up cool. using that one but it's um but it's i, I think, I, think it's really I just really i just had an epiphany here i think somebody could take your code and turn it into the, the recycling center just have you a camera can. set up and Same they could all, even though yeah. even those slobs like me who don't have the time to put things yeah. in the right bin automatically yeah. you could do that you could automatically sort based on routed. that you absolutely could you absolutely could so it could be used at, at a re recycling center like all kinds of things you could do and so that's just one example of something that you know that kind of scale of all the things that a recycling center sees like they have so much trash to sort like sure. they're, they're probably it's going to be a hard cost benefit analysis to make it worth it for one of these large language models but for a small language model that they can run locally i think it's something that is now possible so it was kind of a neat example of something there that was go. that was new yeah yeah i love i love projects that are they're fun to build and they make the world a better place exactly that's what makes me happy too <laughs> and then the final demo that we did yeah. for build was um something that was shown in the keynote that was an example of um kevin asked me so we we got access like right before it was literally one o'clock the day before the keynote 1 p.m the day <laughs> no before pressure. the pressure yeah, no pressure at all we got um we got access to the audio version of the um the gpt 4.0 um thing so it's pure audio in audio out where the audio is being uh, directly converted into tokens mm. and so um, Kevin kind of looked at me and said, no pressure, but, you know, do you think you'd be able to create um, a, a demo that has something to do with code? And I think it actually says a lot about Kevin, about like how sweet he was about 
that whole process because like I actually went off and I created something really quick. I did, I like was like thinking about what are some common like Python coding errors that you could make and something easy that'd be easily digestible because like in these keynotes, like every single minute is accounted for. Like he oh, has yeah. literally down to the minute of like what he's going to talk about. So I'm like, this has to be super tight. So it has to be something that people can like grok immediately. So I just chose like a simple, stupid Python coding <laughs> error and I coded up something real quick that showed like me talking through an example um, with with the the phone on the audio of um, speaking with the GPT 4.0 model and asking for help with this scenario. And the one thing that I didn't like about that demo was that it you know it, it made me look kind of like an idiot. <laughs> the fact that I uh, would because make you this deliberately plan. made a mistake. Yeah, like I was deliberately making a second. I was like, oh man, like what am I doing for like women in tech and stuff by like doing this in a public thing? Like, you, you know, those kind of things, like you, you think about them sometimes. But I got to hand it to Kevin. Like I pitched him on the demo, like he, like after, like he and Satya did their rehearsals and stuff. And then he and Satya sync afterwards. And then the comms people went in and talk about some of the revisions. And then I went in with him to talk about the demo. Um, show him my demo idea that I had created from like 1 p.m. the night before. And he was like, he he listened to it. He's like, I, I love it. Like, let's do that. And he's like, and I want to say like the, in, in real life, you would never make this mistake. <laughs> like he, and he said that to me immediately, David, like yeah. his comments he, he, were not he recognized your concern. Yes. Yes. He, he had the foresight to think of that himself and to proactively bring it up with me. And like, that's a good person. Right. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing like you don't, I, everyone you could see just like backstage at build. There's some people that are just running around with their hair on fire, but like, he really is one of the the good execs and I, I trust him. And that's part of the reason that like, I know like when, when you see kind of some of these scary things in the news and stuff, I'm like, I know everything's going to be okay. Cause I just, I trust Kevin. He's sure. Gonna, you hear a lot of stories about right people thing. with a lot of power that abuse that power. They're not yeah. nice people. It's yeah. good to hear about someone who's in a position of authority who uh, uses that to be kind to someone. Exactly. Exactly. No, I, I really have a high opinion of him. Uh, Jennifer, we're just about at time. Uh, well, will you be at Ignite this year? I do not think so right now. Kevin uh, typically does not do a keynote at, at Ignite. Typically, he only does it at Build. Okay. So I don't think so, Too but bad. you never know. It's only a mile from my house. Oh, that's so fun. <laughs> oh, cool. Maybe I'll have to come just for that then. Uh, Chicago I, isn't too far away. You absolutely away. should. Jennifer, <laughs> thank you so much for your time. This has been really entertaining and educational. Always good to see you. David Giard and I met through our mutual work in the developer community. And the developer community is a beautiful marriage of technology and friends.